tonight's message, there we go, let me go back to the beginning, as in the days of Noah. So, you know, as I was praying, there was so much in the Torah portion, um, the, the Parsha of Noah, which is, we just read, is from Genesis 6, 9 through 11, 32. So I was really praying and wanting to hear the mind of the Lord as to what to share with you tonight. And I felt like the Holy Spirit gave me a teaching that is something that ties in with, I think, where we are in the culture today. And it's something that uh, will be for us not just a warning, but I think an eye opener. Some of what you're going to hear tonight, you've never heard before, I can tell you that, because it's Revelation, things the Holy Spirit's been revealing to me, and uh, <clears throat> it's going to be interesting. So I want you to have an open heart, open mind, and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you in these last days. How many of you know these are the end times of the end times? Amen? There are some strange things going on. This past week, a video has come about from Israel of this young man, very young man, who the older rabbi are revering as Messiah. And it is claimed that he's done four miracles, but the thing is, none of these miracles does he give any credit to God. So uh, he's been fluent and efficient in not just Torah, but in the Talmud, which is like, what, 123 books? Like, all these commentaries over the ages, since the age of 15, and I'm not saying he's the false prophet. I'm just saying that apparently in our Messiah and the nation of Israel, these revered rabbis, many of them are going crazy over this guy. I saw a video kissing his hand. I mean, just crowding around him. Uh, and to me, one day the false prophet is going to be somebody, obviously, who's very revered in Israel because he's going to worship the Antichrist. So, anywho, I think no matter what, he's definitely a false prophet. The Bible says that many would come saying, I'm Messiah, right. and would deceive many. Right. So whether he is the false prophet, we have no way of knowing what the future holds. But I can tell you this, if he's not, the one who is is certainly in the wings. And the world is being set up for the greatest deception the planet's ever seen. Right. Just so you know. So let's start our study. I love this picture. How many of you have had an opportunity to go to Kentucky? Uh, or is it Kansas or Kentucky? Kentucky. I thought it was Kentucky. To Kentucky where this is the literal life-size replica that they've made of Noah's Ark. And uh, the reason I wanted to show you a picture is just to give you a scale of the size of it's one thing, you know, how many of you know that Noah's Ark be has become like this uh, nursery decoration for people's baby nurseries? And it's not at all realistic, which is fine, but I'm just saying, I want you all to have a comprehension of the scale of that boat. You may not know this, but they've actually engineered to a smaller replica, obviously, of Noah's Ark, and they taste tested it at the same place that they test models of the United States Navy ships. And they found that the way it was built, it could not be capsized. So pretty fascinating. And of course, God knew that. Amen? I just wanted to kind of point that out as we start in on our study here tonight. So I do want to start in the book of Genesis, chapter 6, verse 9 through verse 13. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. You know, it's interesting. It uses the same terminology given as Enoch. Enoch walked with God and was not. Amen? I want the Lord to say of you and I that we walk with God. Amen? We walk with God. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt. And I want to talk to you a little bit tonight about what some of that corruption was. The scripture gives us actually many hints. All, for all flesh, everybody say all flesh. All flesh. 
all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, through those who have corrupted the earth, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Violence filled the earth. The flesh of man was corrupted, literally a spoiling or a decay of human DNA. Now, you may not know this, but the scripture teaches that there were two outbreaks of giants, one that took place prior to the flood and one that took place after the flood. And we're going to look at the scripture here in just a moment, but it teaches that these giants were the offsprings of fallen angels and the daughters of men. And these giants corrupted man. And they helped to teach man all manner of evil. When they talk about this. So one of the corruptions of man was the human DNA genome. The human genome was corrupted by fallen angels. Matter of fact, I would say that they came within eight people of coming up with their plan. Why would Satan work so hard to corrupt the genome of the human race? Because in the garden, was it not said that from the woman, from her seed, from her ancestry, would come forth one? who would destroy him. So if he could destroy the human genome, he would put an end to the promise of a future Messiah who is coming to destroy him. Now, follow me. Genesis chapter 6, verse 4 through 6. There were giants, Nephilim in the Hebrew. The scripture in the Hebrew also in Psalms, you can read about the Nephilim, the Rephim, also as the children of Israel went into the promised land. Remember, they said we saw them, there were giants in the land, there were Rephim. We were as locusts in our eyes. We were tiny compared to these people. I heard a, a, a man just yesterday doing a teaching on the, on the radio, actually it was on the radio, nationwide, and they were saying that Goliath had a medical condition that called his giant, caused his giantism. I want you to know that it was not a medical condition. He was a descendant of giants. There was two outbreaks, one before the flood and one after the flood. And, you know, we, sometimes as believers, work so hard to explain away the supernatural. And just so you know, there is no explaining way. I'm going to show you the scripture tonight where it talks about these fallen angels and it talks about where they are today and where they've been reserved for. So there were giants on the earth in those days. And also afterward, after the flood. So before the flood, after the flood. When the sons of God came to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old men of renown. Now how many of you have heard of uh, the Greek uh, mythology, right? Of Zeus, Apollo, all these. Some speculate, and it's speculation, that some of these individuals were of these race of giants that become men of renown during the flood. And their mythology and their legend passed down through the ages. And how many of you know that fallen angels, demons have always desired to be worshipped? They want to be and desire to be, just like Satan, to be worshipped as God. Then after, then, that word then, then when, after the giants had come on the earth and taken to themselves the daughters of men. Then, after the events of verse 4, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was what? Great in the earth. And that every intent of his thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, how many of you know, even today with modern uh, technology, they're designing this virtual reality where you can do anything in the virtual world that you won't dare do in the natural world. And so it's a way of being able to do evil continually without the consequences. Have you thought about that? And the Lord was sorry they made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. This breaks my heart. God's creation, whom he loved, he was so grieved over what had become of mankind, of humanity, that it grieved in his heart 
that he even knew me. So I want you to see, thinking from Heavenly Father's perspective, this is what to become of planet Earth. This is what to become of humanity at the time of Noah. Now I'm going to relate this here in a minute to modern day. Yeshua, our Lord, tells us in Matthew chapter 24, verse 37 through 39, but as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, that makes me pause. That makes me say, okay, what exactly was it about the days of Noah that we can expect in the days in which the return of Yeshua transpired? I want to know what those things are. Obviously, it's very important. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving the marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now I want to talk to you about our culture's attributes that match the days of Noah. How many of you think there might be a few? How many of you think there might be a lot? Let's take a look. Number one, they were unprepared for what was coming. Unprepared. Listen, in the days of Noah, they thought Noah was a crackpot. He's building a boat, probably in the middle of the woods, because that's where the wood was, right? Why would you build it in the desert and have to haul lumber? It's going to flood, so you build it where the wood is. So he's building a boat, probably where the wood is, and he's got all these animals. We read the animals came by two, but they also came by seven. Okay? The clean were by seven, the unclean was by two, FYI. So anybody that says that they just came in by two, didn't read all the scripture or all the partial. The queen were by seven. Everybody say by seven. Now, last time I checked, seven pairs is how many animals? Well, that's actually two. Fourteen. There is fourteen. But the queen, why? Because when they landed safely, they ate some of the animals and they sacrificed some of the animals to God. Amen? So they had to have extra. Otherwise, the animals would have gone extinct. Unbelieving of what was coming. So not only, let me mention this, so they were unprepared. So they saw Noah building this ark. Noah had been, the Bible tells us, and I believe it was in Hebrews, and we're going to look at it here in a little bit, that he was a preacher of righteousness. So he preached what was coming. He warned them, even as he was building, he was warning people what was coming. How many of them believed him? None. None. They could have entered the ark had they believed. God didn't have him preach just to hear himself talk. He preached 120 years, and nobody responded to his message. So I tell you guys all the time that you're not responsible for people's response. You're responsible for sharing the message of the good news of Yeshua. Amen? How they receive it is between them and Holy Spirit. So these 120 years, Noah's building and preaching Nobody's responding. They must have literally thought he had lost his mind. Because let me tell you something else you may not know. Before the flood of Noah, it never rained. The Bible says that a mist came up out of the earth and watered the ground. They didn't know what rain was. So for him to say, hey, it's going to flood and water's going to come out of the sky, and he's building this giant boat in the middle of probably the forest, they thought he had absolutely gone crazy. I mean, that's crazy preacher man anyway. How many of you know that today there are mockers and scoffers everywhere? You don't believe it? Look on social media. You mentioned something about Messiah. That's a fairy tale. You're just lost in space. Oh, you need to listen to science or whatever their thing is. So the mockers and the scoffers abound. But what's hilarious is we actually have a relationship with Messiah. That's what separates us from religion. Someone say amen. amen. We have the presence of Holy Spirit. We have an abiding relationship with him. We've been born again. We've been saved. We've experienced his redemption, his salvation. We've been transformed. We've been changed. Amen? So mockers and scoffers can mock and scoff, but they cannot convince those who've met Messiah that you haven't met Messiah. That's crazy. Amen? Unbelieving 
of what was coming. That was the activity of the day. They did not believe it. Noah was a preacher of righteousness, we said, for 120 years. How many of you know that we warn people the worst parts of the Bible are ahead of us? We warn them again and again and again to get right, to prepare their home, prepare their heart, because the Lord's soon return is coming. Someone say amen. So don't be surprised if they don't listen. But our job is still to give them evidence. Amen? And some will. The earth was filled with violence, it says in Genesis 6, 11. Now, I want you to hear me closely. When we talk about violence today, there's violence that you see from a human perspective, and there's violence that Heavenly Father sees from God's perspective. So I want to take you off the planet Earth. I want you to zoom 30,000 feet into the air. I want you to see things from Heavenly Father's perspective. And I want you to know he's not talking about muggings and break-ins and all that's terrible. That's always been since man first fell into sin. The violence, I believe, Holy Spirit is referring to that relates to our day is the murder of unborn babies around the world. I can't think of a more violent act than to physically pull apart an unborn baby room by room and put them to death. From God's perspective, that has to be the most violent thing on the planet. Would you agree? An average of 50 million abortions murdered babies per year worldwide. 50 million. 50 million. How many Jewish people perished during the Holocaust? They say about 60 million. Okay? Terrible. But did you know that Israel has aborted more Jewish babies than Jews who died in the Holocaust? Terrible. So I'm telling you from Heavenly Father's perspective, there is violence on this earth, the likes of which you and I could not fathom if we're looking at things from Heavenly Father's perspective. Come on, say amen. I looked it up and did a little mathematics, and give or take, there's been approximately 600 million people murdered total for abortion around the world. 600 million. Now that's such a large number, most of us can't even fathom that number. So let me help you. There are approximately 300 million people that live in America. So you could take twice the population of our nation wiped out. And like I told you, not only when you kill a baby, have you killed that child, but what happens is they killed all the ancestry that would ever come forth from that baby. When Cain killed Abel and slew Abel, not only did he slay Abel, he slayed all the ancestry, all the descendants that would ever descend from Abel. So when Abel's blood cried out to God, it was not just Abel, but it was all those ancestors who would have come forth through Abel that never had an opportunity. So again, I'm telling you this not to gross you out, though it should gross you out. I'm telling you this to see things maybe a little bit from Heavenly Father's perspective of how today relates to the days of Noah. And that violence is something that is reprehensible. It's incomprehensible. It's the worst ongoing global violence taking place right now in history. Worse than any war, worse than any battle, worse than anything we can imagine. Now, most of us who are alive today, we live in like this pressure cooker where the water is getting hotter and hotter, and most people, even believers, don't even think about it because they've learned to live with this for so long, they don't realize from Heavenly Father's perspective how massively, atrociously evil this stuff is. So that's why it's important to try to get Heavenly Father's perspective on things. And this is not even a political, it's not a political thing. I tell my kids, well, you're being political. Listen, it's demonic, it's satanic. It is a demonic, satanic attack on the planet, on humanity, with this demonic spirit of violence. 
And this sacrifice literally to the demon Mola, even though they don't call him that, is still a demonic sacrifice to the God of prosperity. And so I just want you to think about that. Here are some other attributes that match the days of Noah from our culture. All flesh had corrupted their way on the earth, it says in Genesis 6.12. In Jude chapter 1, verse 6, remember I mentioned to you about the outbreak of giants, how these fallen angels took upon themselves the daughter of men and procreated and created these men of renown, created these Raphim, these Nephilim, okay? And in Jude 1, 6, it tells us that the angels who did not keep their proper domain, their proper habitation, but left their own abode, he is reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. And I believe that those were the fallen angels that transpired to take upon themselves the daughters of men, to corrupt the human genome to keep Messiah from coming forth. And it's tried twice, once before the flood and after the flood. What do you think? Now we're going to get a little deep. I'm going to give you some meat with the potatoes, okay? What do you think the Antichrist will offer in exchange for receiving his mark, number, or name on them? Now, this is in the realm of speculation, but I want you to think about some things. I want to give you some things to think about. You know, for <laughs> I remember as a new believer, I was a 17, just turned 18, and had just started coming to our youth group. And in our youth group, they were showing this 1970s. Uh, now, this was 1982, I think, 1983, anyway, somewhere in the early 80s when I got saved. And they were showing this uh, Left Behind series from, like, 1973. How many of you have ever seen it? And it was a whole, like, five-part series. <laughs> and now you watch it, it's kind of hokey. You know, honestly, but then I was a kid, it scared me to death. Because I was a new believer, I didn't know what was going Lord, don't leave me behind. <laughs> Whatever happens, I mean, the alarm clock going off, and you've got the 70s psychedelic music playing in the background, and they're running from the Antichrist for their life. I mean, it's kind of, kind of funny. But, you know, at that time, you know, computers weren't around, none of that, but they were predicting one day. You know, it might be a computer chip, it might be something still today, you hear all kinds of people. They were saying that the vaccine was the mark, no, the vaccine is not the mark of the beast. Okay? They were saying all this crazy stuff is the mark. But I want you to know, what is the Lord Jesus Christ offered to his people? And how many of you know that Satan always works to counterfeit what God has done? And if the Lord has offered eternal life to us, could it be that perhaps Antichrist offers anybody who receives this mark will have eternal life? And literally, their gene manipulation will take place in this human being that will allow them to be free to come from some of the sicknesses and diseases that often kill people. Now, am I speculating on that, or is there some scripture that could lead us to think that? Let's find out here in a little bit. Could it be that the mark of the beast will change the human DNA to the point that it's no longer human? Did you know, and I'm going to show you here in a minute in Scripture, that the only sin the Bible says that a human being cannot be forgiven of is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Except in Revelation, there is no repentance from receiving the mark of the beast. Now, why would that be? If you're alive and you're human, why can't you repent if you just want, oh, I shouldn't have gotten that mark? Unless maybe it changes and alters your human DNA to the point where you're no longer a human being. And Jesus came and died for you. And you say, well, you haven't had any speculation. Let's see if there's some clues or some hints. Can't prove it, but there are some hints. I want to show them to you tonight. Revelation 9 6. There's a scripture. Now, if you read before this several verses, it talks about these locusts. These scorpions, these things that come to sting the people that receive the mark of the beast. And this is probably one of the scariest, most cryptic, most fascinating scriptures in the Bible, in the book of Revelation. In those days, men who get stung by these creatures, I talked about in verses before, you can go back and read it on your own, will not find it. They will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will what? 
away from me. That's crazy. That's like, how is that possible? How can death, wait, how can these people be in so much pain they want to die, but they can't die? Unless something happens to their DNA, maybe they're no longer human. Let's keep going. Revelation 14, 9 through 11. Then a third angel follows him, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. That's some serious stuff. If that's not the strongest worded warning about something. You know, I've seen some end time movies where somebody gets the mark and they change their mind. Oh, I shouldn't have done it. No, there's no, no mind changing. It's like, that's it. So a little speculation that something transpires where it changes the human being to where even after they get stung by these scorpions, they seek to die but can't die. They desire death, but death flees from them. And yet, there's a special wrath that's going to be poured out, not only upon them, but upon the Antichrist and upon his false prophet in those days. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. They have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Now, to me, and I could be wrong, but this just seems different than the second resurrection, where remember all the all the dead who have ever died are resurrected and stand before the great white throne judgment, and the books are opened, and anyone whose name is not found in the Lamb's Book of Life is cast into the lake of fire. But this is like, man, this is a whole other level of judgment right here. There is no repentance for the individual who receives the mark of his name. And I would say to ask yourself, why? Now, of course, we'll never know if I'm right or wrong. It's not something to do. And it is a little bit of reading between the lines. But I'm telling you, there's something strange about this mark, more than it's just worshiping the Antichrist, because the people that receive it cannot repent from it after. There is no changing the mind, no turning back. This is another fascinating thing here in Revelation 19.20. It says, then the beast was captured, that's the Antichrist, and with him the false prophet, who worked signs in his presence. Remember, you may not remember, but the false prophet works the miracles for Antichrist. The false, I mean, the, the uh, yeah, the false prophet literally works the signs, works the miracles. He is the counterfeit of the Holy Spirit. How many of you know it's the Holy Spirit that works the supernatural, Right? The Holy Spirit doesn't come to glorify himself, the scripture says, but comes to glorify Jesus. Jesus did not come to glorify himself, but came to glorify the Father, right? So Antichrist is there to glorify his Father, which is Satan, and false prophet is there to do miracles and signs to point people and cause people to worship who? Antichrist. Do you see the counterfeit? Just more counterfeit. So with him, the false prophet who works signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worship his image. These two, look at this, were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. Now how could they have been cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone unless perhaps they themselves were Nephilim? They themselves, their genetic DNA had been changed. They never died. They were taken, they weren't resurrected, right? They were just taken and thrown alive into the lake of fire. Everyone else who's ever been an unbeliever, except for the people here who received the mark, they die. They get resurrected. They stand before God. Not the false prophet, not the antichrist. They're thrown alive. They're never killed. Interesting, isn't it? Matthew 24, 40 through 42, the rest of this. Then two... Now, men here is italics. Whenever you see it in italics in the scripture, it literally means it's not in the original language, but they added it. The interpreters, the translators added it to try to make more sense of the scripture. But 
They literally read, then two will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two will be grinded at the mill, one will be taken, the other left. Watch therefore, everybody say watch therefore. Watch therefore. For you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. So listen, if there's nothing else we hear tonight, I want you to hear this. There are so many similarities between the days of Noah that Yeshua warned us about in our culture today that we better make sure that we're watching, that we're fully awake, fully alert, not flirting with sin, not flirting with disaster, and our hearts are in the right, appropriate place with the Lord. Amen? Amen. Because you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. You don't know. I know it's going to be soon. And people speculate, well, you know, the Lord can't come until this happens, until this happens. But listen, the Lord can do what he's going to do. And he tells us he's going to take a lot of the world by surprise. So my caution is we do what the Lord says and watch. Everybody say, watch. Watch. Where God did not spare the angels. Uh-oh, now we're speaking to the church. Peter, writing to the congregation, writing to the ecclesia, writing to the called out ones. Where God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Now we're back to Jude. And did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of what? Righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. Then it goes on and talks about how he will not spare those in verse 13 and 14 and will receive the wages of unrighteousness. This is talking, and you can read in, I wish I all the time to go through the whole chapter. But you can read it in your own time. But literally, he's speaking of those who claim to be believers who are living in gross immorality and gross sin. How many of you saw that this last week the Presbyterian denomination has voted to add new genders to their membership role? They've added queer and transvestite, I'm sorry, transgender or whatever, to their membership role. So the whole thing is just, it's not going to get better until the Lord returns. Amen? So we need to wake up. And they will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. This is the believers who aren't watching. They are spots and blemishes, carousing in their own deceptions while they what? Peace with you. So they're with the believers. They're the terrors in the congregation. They're with you, but they're not of you. Carousing in their own deceptions. So the point here is if God didn't spare the ancient world, he's not going to spare the terrors. I know this isn't very popular because everybody wants to just live however they want and think it's okay. And I'm telling you, the scripture doesn't teach that. Having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. And I could go into detail. Today, I mean, modern day pornography is just as prevalent in the body of Messiah as it is outside. It's everywhere. And people justify it. Well, don't go play, you know. I'm not actually doing it. Last time I checked, if you lust after a woman in your heart and thought about it, it's just like you did it, Yeshua said. Amen? So we need to keep ourselves free from the trash of this world. And it is trash. They have a heart trained in covetous practice and are a curse. What? So, I want to close with this thought. Kind of a scary thing. What's the message here? As I read through the parts of Noah, I thought about two things. I thought about the believers who are arriving the fence and need to be alert and awake, turning their lamps, making sure their lamps are filled with oil, making sure their homes, their lives, their hearts are right before the Lord. And I was thinking about the unbelievers, like Rabbi Jay and Alex are going to minister to, like we have in our own city, even in Abilene. All these people who do not know the truth or are stuck in religion. Religion doesn't save. Only a relationship in the Messiah. Amen? 
So, the ninth, it's the same person, and I want to pray for it, that the Holy Spirit makes us alert, aware, watchful, and help us to see culture from his perspective. Not to be so immersed in this world that the water's boiling and we just boil to death because we don't even realize how bad things have gotten. Heavenly Father, we bless you, we love you, we thank you for the good word of the Lord tonight. Father, I pray, Lord, that your word bring about the fear of the Lord in our hearts and our minds and our spirits. That we desire, Lord, we know, Lord, that we're not saved by works. Father, we're saved by faith in Messiah, your redemptive power. But, Lord, you've redeemed us and transformed us, and then you've called us to walk and to live holy, Lord to be a reflection of Messiah in all that we do. Not to give in to the flesh, because to give in to the flesh, to live after the flesh, is death. But to walk and to live after the Spirit, you said in Romans, it's life and peace. Father, help us to walk in the Spirit, that we not fulfill the deeds of the flesh. Help us to be uncomfortable with the things you're uncomfortable with. And help us, Lord, to share and to spread the good news of Messiah. All those around about. Yes. And to say, wake up. The time's coming. Wake up. Yes. Wake up. Even with those who call themselves believers but are not living for you, Lord. We say, wake up. To those who are watching by YouTube and Facebook, we say, watch. Be alert. Wake up. Wake up. One day the rain's going to come. The flood's going to come. The ark's going to float. The door's going to be closed. It's going to be too late. Too late. Yeshua tells the parable. The bridegroom came. And they cried out, Behold, the bridegroom come. Ten virgins woke up. Five had oil, five didn't. Five were allowed entry, five were not. The door was shut. They went, Come in, they couldn't come. It was too late. So, Father, help us to be alert. Help us to be alert. Thank you for grace. Thank you for mercy. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for forgiveness and redemption for Messiah. Help us, Lord, to walk pleasing in your sight. Yes. All that's not of you, Father. Yes. Cleanse us. Change us. Blow yes. afresh in our lives, Father. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, and all God's people said.